Welcome to Bitcoin Decrypted. This is an introduction to Bitcoin spanning practical, technical, and social theory perspectives in an integrated narrative. Many existing introductions to Bitcoin are either practical or technical. Economic theory discussions, meanwhile, have often suffered from weak or even non-existent technical foundations, leaving them poorly connected to reality. I conceived the following three-part approach, partly as a way to fill these gaps. The parts are context and overview, technical aspects, and social theory aspects. This grew out of two presentations I gave at the third annual Australian Mises Seminar in Brisbane on November 30th and December 1st, 2013. This new recording and slide presentation includes additional details and more complete explanations on some points. Part 1, Context and Overview Understanding Bitcoin is a learning-intensive process, one that I have been engaged in for much of 2013. Not understanding it is fairly simple and much easier. Still, I would like to offer some perspectives and approaches to understanding it that have taken shape and stood out so far in my research. It is important to look from several different angles, practical, technical, economic, and historical, to name a few. I begin with some large-scale historical background that sets the stage for the arrival of Bitcoin, followed by some practical observations on what it is being used for today, its production rate, and its exchange rate trends. Precious metal coins once circulated as money. They were money in themselves. Pieces of paper and equivalent bank account entries are money today. A long process led from one to the other. The pieces of paper and account entries started as substitutes that traded at fixed rates for precious metals. They were supposed to represent the metal units, which is why they came to be called money substitutes. However, after a centuries-long process, the links between metals and substitutes eroded until the last trace was gone in 1971. The paper and account entries continued, but were no longer money substitutes, they became the money itself, pure fiat money. This history has many different stages and details, but still shows some overall patterns. The amount of metal that each given money substitute unit exchanged for at a fixed rate declined until it finally reached zero. The substitute units, with names like dollars, were repeatedly redefined to equal less and less actual metal. Finally, when there was no link to metal at all, the purchasing power of each fiat unit could be degraded simply by printing more paper or issuing more new units on a computer, as we see today. In all cases, though, value gravitated toward the managers of the monetary system and away from most ordinary money users. These system managers at different stages of history can be roughly characterized as the State and Major Banks Alliance. This alliance seems focused on two things, using other people's money and going as far into debt as possible. The state part of this alliance uses these means to help expand its employments of young people in warring against other states abroad and micromanaging the lives of innocent persons at home. The major banks part of the alliance, whatever else is happening, seems content with just making a lot of money in the process. This duo has taken turns bailing each other out from the predictable results of their schemes for a long time. This is nothing new. The forms and methods have just been refined. As a culmination of this process, the full discretion to manipulate the aggregate stock of money is concentrated among appointees carefully screened and selected by the State and Major Banks Alliance itself. This is not all bad, though. It is supposed to be good for ordinary money users. The Alliance has always promised that in exchange for its great powers over money, it will provide a stable currency and will finally put an end to financial crises. It still seems to struggle with those parts. Many critics of pure fiat money propose to go back. Going all the way back would mean using precious metal coins directly, but this works best only in person and locally. 
The demand for greater convenience and longer distance transfers would remain strong. So long as there are money substitutes, even modern digital grams linked to metal in a vault, the same temptations and risks that have played out throughout monetary history would still be present. The vulnerable links between metal and substitute could once again degrade, possibly leading right back to the same result, fiat money. The root problem may be that using money substitutes relies on trusting third parties to honestly manage the relationship between commodities and substitutes, and to conduct transfers over distances and in larger amounts. However, the historical record shows that such trust has always been violated, first a little and by a few, and later systematically by all and with official permission. Yet the many problems with both money substitutes and their fiat money descendants are still greater as this modern analysis points out. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. We have to trust them with our privacy, Trust them not to let identity thieves drain our accounts. This is how the problem was described in 2009 by the creator of Bitcoin, going by the chosen name Satoshi Nakamoto. Yet most of these problems also apply to historical money substitutes that were allegedly backed by metal. If the only significant way for people to store and transfer their wealth is to trust some third party for assistance, this sets up a high-risk potential failure point. Directly using metallic coins in person avoided this, but was limited in scope. Money substitutes and later fiat monies helped remedy some of those limitations, but created new risks and problems of their own. Would it be possible to create a new type of unit altogether, one that could avoid this interrelated complex of problems? It was at this historical impasse that Nakamoto launched Bitcoin in 2009. Bitcoin units avoid the drawbacks of metallic coins since they have no weight and can be transported instantly anywhere in the world at trivial cost. In many ways, they are more convenient for users than traditional money substitutes and fiat monies, which were adopted in part due to their convenience. They are not subject to unpredictable inflation of units, and users do not have to rely on trusted third parties for transfers over distance or in larger amounts. Since Bitcoin seems to solve so many of the problems inherent in all previous and existing monetary systems, it should be worth investigating closely. Instead of looking more closely, however, a more common response has been to look hardly at all and then dismiss Bitcoin or even warn that it must be a scam or a Ponzi scheme. But one of the telltale signs of a scam is that the more closely one looks, the more suspicious it appears. My experiences with learning about Bitcoin and from longtime Bitcoin experts have suggested just the opposite. The more carefully that people investigate, the more interested they seem to become, and some of those most impressed are experts in relevant, specialized fields. For example, Bitcoin should be differentiated from the many previous digital currency projects that did fail. As Nakamoto wrote in 2009, a lot of people automatically dismiss e-currency as a lost cause because of all the companies that failed since the 1990s. I hope it's obvious that it was only the centrally controlled nature of those systems that doomed them. I think this is the first time we're trying a decentralized, non-trust-based system. It is also important to examine the history and current operation of Bitcoin separately from speculations about its future. Ludwig von Mises was especially strict in separating the three domains of abstract theory, historical and case interpretation, and prediction. My focus in Bitcoin research is mainly on what is and what has been. This can be a challenge because people are naturally curious about the future. Yet, a clearer understanding of what is and what has been should also be of some use if one wants to turn to the challenge of looking ahead. Speaking of the future, though, 
since I began investigating Bitcoin earlier this year, my science fiction reading has come to a halt. It has seemed, at times, as though a great science fiction story, instead of being turned into a book or a film, has instead simply been turned into a reality. I will therefore borrow science fiction grandmaster Arthur C. Clarke's Three Laws to help organize the rest of what follows. Clarke's third law is also the best known. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. In part two, we will talk about the advanced technology part more, but for now I will leave some things to the imagination. Images can sometimes lead to a quicker initial grasp of what Bitcoin makes possible, and this can also make understanding the technical details easier later on. Right now, with a phone or a computer, any Bitcoin user can transfer purchasing power directly to any other. It arrives instantly, the cost is trivial, and the actual good enters the direct control of the receiver. Bitcoin is not a substitute for anything else. As a metal coin was, it is in itself the monetary good. Unlike a metallic coin, though, it can be teleported anywhere and divided up into the tiniest parts at will. For safekeeping against thieves, one can hide the same Bitcoin in several different places at the same time. Then, when one recovers it from one place, it instantly disappears from all the others, too. One can also take a Bitcoin apart in a different way, into layers, and hide each layer in a different place. Anyone who found only some of those layers couldn't do anything with them. Only one who could find all the layers and put them all back together in the right way could spend any part of the coin. Compared to metal coins, such things might seem magical or impossible, but these things are already possible today. Every Bitcoin unit is assigned to one or more addresses. Addresses are managed in wallet files, or they can be created and printed out. Here is one simple image to get a quick sense of how Bitcoin addresses work. Each piggy bank has a unique address so coins can be sent to the right one. Anyone can put Bitcoins in at the top and cannot be stopped from adding more. The real trick is that this is a German piggy bank. It is indestructible and has a unique key without which it cannot be opened. If the key is stolen, the coins could be too. If the key is lost, the coins are stuck inside, possibly forever. This is why it is very important for Bitcoin users to be strict about making wallet backups. Anyone can create pairs of addresses and keys, and even do so offline. Such addresses do not conflict with each other because so many are possible. One rough way to picture how many is to imagine all the grains of sand on the earth. Then imagine that each of those grains is a whole other earth, each with that many more grains of sand of its own. All the grains of sand on all of those earths combined give some sense of how many different Bitcoin addresses are possible. A wallet that is online and ready to use is called a hot wallet. In contrast, a cold storage wallet is for better security against remote theft. The highest security cold storage keys are created on offline devices and then always kept offline. For individual and corporate users, many more detailed practical tutorials and different software offerings are available online for investigation and comparison. There is no better way to get a sense of what Bitcoin makes possible than to choose and download some wallet software and try it out with small amounts. There are many options, many of which are open source and free of charge. Some promising initial applications for Bitcoin in the real world include payments and remittances. Few users of credit cards and PayPal understand that merchants pay high fees to accept such payments, several percentage points online and higher in restaurants, for example. If a merchant's profit margin is 8% and the fee 4%, that's half their profit. Using Bitcoin eliminates this cost either nearly or entirely. Existing payment methods also enable chargeback fraud in which buyers cancel payments after a good or service has been delivered. This costs merchants a great deal each year. With Bitcoin, a user sends a unique signed transaction. It contains no information that can be used 
to create any other transaction. This push method is much more secure than conventional pull methods. With credit cards, the buyer has to give the seller all the information needed to extract the money. This information can be intercepted and used for fraud. Identity theft remains a major problem with credit cards even after many years of work to remedy it. To visualize push versus pull, compare handing money to a cashier at a shop with handing your wallet to the cashier so that some of your money can be extracted for you. Remittances are especially important to those who move from poorer to richer countries to work and send money to their families back home. The few companies that provide this service at all charge surprisingly high fees and have many limitations on time frames, destinations, and amounts. If those at both ends used Bitcoin directly, as with email, all of the hard-earned wealth sent would also arrive immediately and regardless of amount or destination. Direct use at both ends may not yet be practical for many people in this situation, but some companies are working to offer lower cost remittances using Bitcoin internally while local monies come in and go out at each end. Direct donations to bloggers and dissidents can route around financial censorship and financial blockades of organizations that support dissidents and those willing to report on officially concealed crimes and abuses of power. The Bitcoin protocol also enables new online business models based on micropayments and other features, including built-in escrow and multi-signature transaction support. So if these Bitcoins can be so useful, where do they come from and how many are there? An analogy to metal mining has often been used, but this particular ore at first seems strange and magical. It may be helpful to imagine that the only source of Bitcoin ore is in the Bitcoin mine. There are no other sources anywhere else. While more gold and silver can always be discovered, the maximum possible supply of Bitcoins is already known, as is the approximate rate of mine production. All Bitcoin ore in the universe is in here. Anyone can mine any time, but finding new ore gets harder and harder and harder. Half of all possible Bitcoins were already mined by November 2012. About every four years, probably a little faster, half of what remain are mined. There are only 21 million possible Bitcoins. Each equals 100 million Satoshis, which are the actual units. A Bitcoin was just a convenient initial denomination. Other denominations may come into use as a new practicality. A millibitcoin, for example, currently trades for about a dollar. The conventional spoken names of these units are also likely to evolve into convenient forms over time. In contrast, as fiat currencies lose value, new denominations have to be printed with more zeros on them. Bitcoin has been doing the opposite. A hundredth of a bitcoin today buys what a hundred bitcoins did a couple of years ago. The media often report that the maximum will be reached around the year 2140. However, not many people realize that most of the important changes are set to happen within the next 10 years, by which time more than 90% of all possible bitcoins will already have been produced. This rises to 98.4% by 2031, with the remaining 1.6% over the following 110 years. The annual rate of new Bitcoin production relative to the total outstanding is now about 13%. This means that Bitcoin's rising exchange rate trend right now is happening despite 13% annualized unit growth. However, this is to fall below 2% by about 2021 and then continue falling toward zero. The exchange rate is still quite volatile. Waves of popular media attention and new interest alternate with waves of fear and uncertainty about regulatory environments. This seems natural for a technology so new and poorly understood. And it should be recalled for context that many major disruptive innovations in history, whether telescopes, printing presses, or the literary form of the novel, have initially been met with some combination of vilification and dismissal. 
If Bitcoin does continue to succeed over the long term and grows further in scale and usage, its exchange value is likely to become more stable. This is the all-time Bitcoin price history on the Mt. Gox exchange through early December 2013 by weekly weighted average on a linear scale. The media like to create the most volatile image they can to enhance their headlines. The most extreme available numbers are chosen and repeated without much regard for relative significance, and charts such as this are beloved in this role. However, a linear scale distorts the proportions of relative changes across time. Imagine trying to learn the true shape of the continent of Antarctica by studying the distorted bottom of a flat world map instead of the bottom of a globe. In this case, things look quite different after checking the log scale box on the chart. Some people report having a hard time making sense of Bitcoin exchange rate movements so far. Maybe this will help. Here is the same progression year over year. This still looks rough, but each year shows growth and seems to associate very roughly with a level. In this perspective, Bitcoin's price has been moving at a recognizable pace, but instead of going from 1 to 2 to 3, it goes from 1 to 10 to 100. If this pattern were to continue, 2014 could form around the next major level. We can only see what the future actually brings, but we can at least try for a clearer perspective on what the past has already brought. A common objection to Bitcoin is that as its value rises, and is expected to keep rising, people will never spend Bitcoins. They will just hold on to them, waiting for the value to go up forever. This fallacy commits a number of basic errors of economic reasoning. It takes one factor, a presumed desire to save Bitcoin and the expectation that its exchange value will be still higher later, and treats it as the only factor, even though many other factors are also in play. It assumes that all people are the same all the time, and that their value scales never change. It treats a person's entire holding of Bitcoin as an indivisible block, ignoring the possibility of marginal decisions about the use of smaller amounts relative to the person's total balance and context. It also ignores time preference, referring to the fact that people eventually will rather consume some good in the present rather than trying to wait hundreds of years to consume it long after they're dead. Playing directly opposite this supposedly monolithic motivation to hold for the future is the shift in valuations of goods relative to any given percentage of a given person's total Bitcoin holding as the exchange value of Bitcoin changes. To illustrate this idea, here is the tale of the marginal Bitcoin and the marginal $500 suit. If a person has 100 Bitcoins when the price is $5, buying one $500 suit would leave him with one suit and no Bitcoin. However, the same purchase with Bitcoin at $50 leaves him with one suit while he still retains a balance of $4,500 worth of Bitcoin. At $500 per Bitcoin, he gets a suit and still has a Bitcoin holding worth $49,500. Finally, at $5,000, he could buy that same suit and still retain $499,500 worth of Bitcoin. As Bitcoin's exchange value rises, the cost of one suit as a percentage of this person's total Bitcoin holding goes from 100% to 10% to 1% to one-tenth of 1%. As the value of Bitcoin rises, the position of one suit relative to a given unit of Bitcoin on a given person's value scale will tend to change in such a way that the same holder of 100 Bitcoins might be more likely to go ahead and buy the suit. This does not mean that other factors, such as a desire to delay spending in anticipation of a higher future exchange value, are not also present. It just means that this is certainly not the only factor, and that other factors, such as the one illustrated here, actually point in exactly the opposite direction. This concludes part one of Bitcoin Decrypted. 
In part two, we will turn to some key points about how Bitcoin really works from a technical point of view.